Look at the Boston players smiling. But Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. Tatum fires away. Pumps it in. 51 for Jason Tatum. The Big Three NBA podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Welcome to another edition of the Big Three NBA Podcast. Uh, here, Ashra Blakely, joined by Gary Washburn, our good friend and colleague, Kwani A. Lunas, feeling a little under the weather today. Uh, so, you know, maybe she had a little too much uh, celebrating this, this Banner 18. Uh, who knows? Who knows? But uh, yes, I'm going to throw shade at Kwani when she ain't here, Gary. You're damn right I'm going to do it. Yes. Yes, I am him. Uh, speaking of the Celtics, I've... I know. I ain't right. I, I ain't right. World ain't right, though. That's Dale Davis told us many, many times. World ain't right. <laughs> World ain't right. I know. But the Celtics, I mean, obviously, since they won the championship, they've been, been you know, globetrotting uh, out, out of this world sometime in Florida, had the big parade here in Boston. Uh, and in the course of them celebrating, we, we've seen a little bit of a 180 on the national media Uh many of whom thought Dallas was going to win in five, six, sometimes seven games. And it's, it's been interesting to see how they've kind of flipped the script a little bit on explaining why the Celtics were just a better team and, and why the Celtics are this great team now. Uh, but I, I wanted, before we start looking too far into the future, Gary, I wanted us to take a minute to just kind of really, just kind of look back and reflect on this, this Celtics team this past year. And, and one of the things I, you know, I wanted to just kind of get your take on was, you know, there was a lot of big moments for this team, I thought, this year. But when you think about just the most memorable moment or just a couple of memorable moments, what comes to mind right away for you? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I just think, I think the first game when they just blew out Miami on the road mm-hmm. during the regular season, um, in Jan- you went out there in January – we just put it on them, and it was like they, they just they just completely blew them out. And I just thought that was a sign that they were kind of getting over some of their past issues. And then on that same road trip, they won at Dallas, and uh, I just thought that was a that was kind of a signature moment for this team. Um, winning at, always winning at L.A., beating the Lakers. Uh, you know, blowing out the Clippers on the road during that Christmas road trip. Um, and it just, honestly, just the consistency, never really, never losing more than two games in a row, um, you know, beating all their rivals, you know, pretty much that home win against Milwaukee. Uh, and I think, you know, when Dame and those guys came in, it was like the first time they faced Dame. Um just a, a overall, like excellence, right? Um, and if you look at you know, and, and if you look at the overtime win uh, when they were really you know kind of exhausted, beating Minnesota at home in overtime, I thought um, putting it on Phoenix on the road uh, during that late late season road trip when they went out to Phoenix and really handed it, hammered uh, the Suns or put it on them late, and then. Um, Beating in, in some of their down at home, beating Dallas again in the regular season by 30, 30 points at home, just an overall dominance. When a team never loses more than two games in a row, I mean, it's just amazing if you look at it. If you look at the wins they had and be able to beat the, the Phillies and the Indianas and the Miamis and the, you know beating the Knicks four times. Um, those are the regular season moments that I remember. Um, and it was just a team effort. You know, Porzingis doing great things. Drew Holiday, of course, Jason and Jalen, Derek White, just having, you know, just having, just seeing those guys play together as a team. And I think it's the one thing. Like, they didn't have a guy, you know, oh, he scored 53 points tonight or 60 points. So they didn't have one of those nights. Everybody would get in on it. And they didn't have, you know, I don't know if they're I mean, their high score. I'm, I think Jalen had by that 41 or 43 in a game. Um, I don't think they had like these incredibly high scores because they were so balanced. So what stands out to me, honestly, is just the consistency and the balance of just taking on. 
Oh, and one of those moments really blowing out Golden State. I mean, just yeah. simply that, like the Warriors, that game was over at halftime, and I think the, the Warriors kind of gave up and, you know, rested Steph and those guys after halftime. Like, some ex- exercising some of those demons of the past, some of those teams that are giving them trouble, putting them down, and, and making a statement. That's what stood out to me. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the point that I was going to make because really I looked at the Miami win and the Golden State win as really the two memorable moments for me with this team because those were two teams that when you look at the hurdles that have kept this Celtics team from just being one of the greatest teams in this five, six year window those are the two teams that really I thought stood out and for them to not just beat them this year but beat the crap out of them I mean it it felt very personal the way they went about dismantling those teams like we're not just we know we're better than you but we're not just going to beat you we are going to annihilate you and just absolutely you know, decimate you in every way imaginable to the point where you're going to be calling for mercy by halftime. And to me, that was a sign for me that this team is a little bit different, uh, that this team is a little bit more locked into not just winning games, but winning games in a fashion that stands out from any other team in the league. Because the, the Golden State win, they won that one by 52. That was the third time this season that they beat someone by 50 or more points, something that no NBA team has ever done in a single regular season. And when you're able to do, you know, when you're making history uh, along the lines of how badly you're absolutely stomping teams, that says a lot about your team, especially when you are a team that isn't necessarily built around being an elite top tier offense I mean they've got guys who can score but the bread and butter the foundation of this team is what they do defensively when you look at Drew Holiday you look at Derek White you look at the growth that we've seen from Jalen Brown and and Tatum along those lines you got Al Horford who's a guy who has been an all NBA defender uh before so defense is what this team does well but they were able to marry top shelf defense with a steadily but consistently improving offense to where they were just frankly a team that could beat you by 52 points and then not score and they won't need to score 180 points to do it. Uh, and to me, again, those are the kind of, of, of moments that as I look back on this team in their season um, really stand out to me. Um, but as far as like the most memorable game, I can't even limit it to the regular season. I got to go to the postseason because those are the games that mattered you most. You said the regular season, man. You you can't be making rules and changing. I'm changing those. the game. Oh, I'm changing man. the game. You said the regular season. I'm like, oh man, I can't think of nothing now. Oh, well, those are changing the playoffs. I can't. Hey, we we like, gonna oh, change man, it up. Well, what's, what's your regular season game, G Money? What's your regular? Season? What's the one regular season game that you want to talk about? The, I say the whole win over the Warriors, like okay. just just sending them home. You know, reeling. Yeah, that that was my regular season. Like, man, maybe this team is different. Like, we're not messing around with you. They lost to them in Golden State in December. They came and put a can on them, a can of whip, whip butt, whip ass on them. So uh, that was the, the regular season game that I probably point to as like, wow, okay, maybe things are different. For me, it was them beating the Bucks. Uh, and, and because to me, it, that was a game of that, that was a team that, frankly, you, you anticipated would be among the last team standing in the Celtics way of getting to the finals. And, you know, to me, that game took on a little bit extra personal because of just oh, the Drew Holiday dynamic, Dame Lillard. Uh, obviously, you know, without Chris Middleton in that game, that, that, that certainly impacted it somewhat. But I, I just... I, I like the fact that there are games that the Celtics played and showed up in that had a little bit more at, on, at stake than just wins and losses. I mean, that, go, that that Milwaukee game, I don't care what any of those players said, it was personal. Dame Lillard had something to prove that Milwaukee getting me is going to make them better. The Celtics had something to prove because Drew Holiday is like, basically, they they kicked you to the curb. They didn't want you no more. They didn't think you had it. They didn't think that the salary that you were – do you're worth it anymore and so uh, this and the fact that the Celtics had to hold on and and just barely got got the win um to me it didn't matter it was the fact is they did what they had to do to beat a team that they were going to in theory have to go through and so for me that was the one memorable game but the Golden State game I, I I can't I can't argue with that one because I mean that did not see that coming 
I mean, you you, you can kind of anticipate that that they were going to win that game, but a 52 point spanking. I mean, because even when the Celtics emptied the bench, they were still getting buckets. They were, and, and that that's just that's not normal, uh, particularly for a Celtics team that when you look at their second unit, it's not like they got a lot of offensive firepower that they can turn to on that on that bench. Uh, they didn't have that all season, and certainly they had moments here and there, but that was not something that you were going to get a steady diet of from this team. Um, so the, the, the Celtics, they definitely had, I, I think, Golden State, Milwaukee, Miami, those are the ones that I thought were really important. But, you know, in any time you win a championship, there's usually that one moment where the season kind of turns in a way that shows that you're different. Uh, which the playoff there were different here. Their little little end season, you know, mantra. W- was there a game, or was there a moment where you thought that the season was was pivoting in a way that c- you could kind of see that this team maybe was going to be good enough to win a championship? Hmm. I probably would say um, just responding from that. I think they lost. I want to say the. I have to look the West Coast road. There's a it was a West Coast road trip. It was a it was a road trip that was late March that they had lost a couple of games, and I think they had lost two in a row. Well, yeah, they had lost to Denver, and they had lost. And it was a you know, and it was a really disappointing loss. Probably the most disappointing loss of the season was at Denver when, you know, it was kind of a hyped up game and mm-hmm. Jason just didn't play well, just was not quite himself. And, and they just kind of slept walk. Jalen was good. He had 41. Um, and, but it was just like, yeah, they lost that um, back-to-back games that Cleveland, that, that uh, Dean Wade game, Right. And two nights later, they lost at Denver, and Galen went for forty-one and fourteen. But Tatum just did not show up offensively, and they went and ran off nine straight wins after that. I thought that was different. They won at Phoenix and Portland. They won at Utah. They beat the Suns again. You know, you know, they beat they beat Milwaukee. Um, they they handled your Pistons. They beat the Bulls. You know, like they came back and said, okay. Like, we're not the old Celtics. We're not going to let this turn into a five-game losing streak. We're going to take care of business. And they won the next nine games. And then yeah. the rest of the season, they lost those two against Atlanta. And I also thought, you know, they came back. They won at New Orleans. They beat the Thunder. They like they could, After that, they won five straight. You know, so this team was always ready to respond from adversity. And I just thought those two losses, it was a crippling loss against Cleveland, and that was after that 52-point law win over Golden State. And then they come back and lose against Denver. And I, everybody was saying, well, Denver is going to be the favorite. The Celtics can't beat Denver in the playoffs. Obviously, we never know because Denver didn't make it there. But the Celtics, after that, responding with nine straight wins, I thought that's what made them different than years past. You know, uh, And they went on to win like 14 to 16 after that. And I just thought that was that's a championship caliber team. I, I thought for for me, I, I got to go back a little bit earlier in the season uh, when they lost their first set of back to back losses, which was to a loss at Minnesota. They lost at Philadelphia, and then they won. I think it was like five or six in a row after that. But for for me, that was a turning point because they lost to two teams that were considered, you know. Minnesota, even then, was one of the better teams out west. And Philadelphia, you know, as long as you got Joel Embiid on your roster, you are going to be a threat uh, in the playoffs because he's that damn good and that dominant. And they real, they ran off like – not only did they win like five or six in a row, but they were hammering teams. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it now. You know, they beat Brooklyn uh, by 14. They beat uh, the, the Raptors. They beat them by 20 and some change. Uh, they beat the Knicks by about 16. They beat Philly and get double digits. Uh, They had the close one against Toronto, uh, but that was, I believe it was a back, no, it was one close game and they beat Memphis. And so they they started to start racking up those wins that showed that, yep, we lost to two really good teams, but we're not going to let this snowball. We're not going to be that team that you've seen before where you lose a couple games and then you might get a win 
and then you might lose a couple more games, and then it becomes one of those four out of five games they lose type situations. They showed early on that I thought that they were built in a way to withstand the ups and downs that come uh, with the NBA season and, and, and prove that, you know, this team was a little bit more mentally tough than I think we thought. Uh, and, and that, to me, when I think about just some of the season turning points, that was when, for me, I really started to believe that this team could go far because they were able to take a very tough back-to-back set of losses and not allow it to snowball. And we saw that throughout the season. Whenever they lost a game here or a couple games there, it never got to the point where it was able to snowball. And when you look at their season trajectory, it began early on with those back-to-back losses to Minnesota and, and Philly. Now, obviously, we're talking about a lot of the great things that happened with this team. But for, for what, Gary, was a low point for you, like where you were just like, damn, I don't know about these cats right about now. Did you have a moment like that? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm going to say there was, there was two late January. They lost it. They got blown out at home by the Clippers. And then, uh, a few nights later, they lost at home to the Lakers without LeBron and AD. And I just thought, come on guys, like that's, that's not a championship team right there. Um, and they responded, obviously, after that Lakers loss. Uh, they won, let me see here, 11 in a row. Mm-hmm. So um, they were, they were, you know, they always bounce back. But I just thought that February 1st game against the Lakers where Austin Reeves went nuts and they just, they just didn't play well. And it was like, come on, guys, like this is not a good Laker team. Even with LeBron and AD, they were they're a good team, but without Hall of Famer and a top two player all time, um, top seventy five guys, you can't beat these team at home. And that was when I thought mentally maybe they weren't quite there, and they just slipped. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a just a slippage, you know, and that's what they did. But they came back a couple nights later. They beat Memphis by forty, and then they beat Atlanta and Washington and. One again at Miami and then beat Brooklyn a couple of times in an all-star break came and they won five more in a row. So, you know, they've always bounced back. But I thought that Laker game at home was one of their probably more disappointing games of the season. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that definitely, you know, stacked up pretty high in, in, in my eyes, too. It, it was really just inexcusable that they lost that game. Uh, you should never lose a game to a team that mediocre. Uh, but for, for me, uh, the point where I was a little bit nervous about this team was when they lost those back-to-back games to the Hawks. Because r- remember, you know, the, the Celtics, they had been flying high all season long uh, and had shown, like, no signs of, of, of crumbling or, or weakness or, or, or mental fatigue or, or just mental struggles or anything like that. And then you go to Atlanta for, you know, a couple games and you get your ass kicked. Uh, by a bad team, and it was a close game. They were both close games, but it, that's to me that's that's besides the point. It should have never been close. That was a that was a trash Atlanta team that you lost to back to back. And then to me, Gary, what, what made me nervous was that after you lost to those two games, then you had to go to New Orleans and deal with Zion Williamson and the Pelicans. And and again, Zion, a healthy Zion, relatively healthy Zion. New Orleans has shown time and time again they're a really good team. When he and, and the rest of their core guys are healthy, they, they're one of the better teams in the Western Conference. And so I'm thinking, like, here we go, the first three-game losing streak that the Celtics are going to have. And they showed up. They won that game by double digits. Uh, Zion, you know, he did what Zion is always going to do, which is put up big numbers. But I'm, I'm looking back at that game, and, you know, the, the Celtics, their, their core guys were good. I mean, Tatum had 23. Uh, they got 19 for, for Przingis. Uh, it was a very balanced effort. But the key to that game for the Celtics, you know, just looking back at the numbers, was their defense. Uh, they did not allow – they kept the Pelicans as a team shooting below 40% from the field, below 40% from three-point range. They, they handled their business on the glass. And so they, it was a reminder that this team, when their backs were to the wall, which I think they felt that their backs were against the wall going into that game because they lost two in a row to a bad team. They respond. And that, to me, is one of the signs of a great championship caliber team, the ability to respond when you absolutely have to get it done. 
Uh, and, and that is to me, it, it became not only uh, was it one of those those moments in that particular stretch of the season, but it became a, almost like an unspoken anthem for them uh, all season long. Respond when, when called upon. So the Boston Celtics just added another championship to their NBA record 18 titles. But there's plenty of games to keep the diehard sports fans and the casuals more than happy. You can get in on the action with Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app with more than 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six players, stat projections, and watch the winnings roll in. And there's no better time than now to get in on the action. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. Now for the mathematically challenge, here's what that means. You can turn $10 into $1,000 just like that. Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and the rest of the Boston Celtics are still celebrating, but that doesn't mean the basketball stops bouncing with prize picks. Women's basketball is still heating up with stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese looking to make names for themselves alongside some of the WNBA greats such as Brianna Stewart and Asia Wilson. You can win up to 100 times your cash watching them ball out this summer. For me, I love the ease and convenience prize picks offers by being able to pick more or less on two to six players. It's super easy to get involved and it's a lot of fun. So to get in on the fun, just download the prize picks app today and use code CLNS for first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS, downloading the prize picks app and use the code CLNS for first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Now, one of the things that we we probably should have done this, and we, we I think we'll probably do that at the beginning of the season, Gary, because we didn't do it this year, but we want I think we do it next year. Is we need to give out some some preseason awards, like make some some prog- you know, some prognostications out here about what. Yes, it's a word today, Gary. It's a word. Stop looking at me. See, Cal Cal. Cubbies, Cal Berkeley, Cash. Y'all think y'all better than everyone. Y'all not. That Syracuse education at work. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anyway, what I what I wanted us to do was just kind of look at just the Celtics roster. Give us some some awards. And and for me, the one of the first awards I want to talk to you about is the biggest surprise performer. Who was the one guy that you saw this season that exceeded your expectations? significantly compared to, to what you thought you were going to be said from them. I'm going to say Luke Cornett. Um, uh, I, didn't damn think, it. I didn't think much of him in terms of like him really contributing, but he did everything he was supposed to do, came off the bench, provided good min- minutes. You know, he contributed to a championship team. You can't ask me more than that. Um, I thought, you know, maybe Kata would, would come in there, maybe take some of his minutes. Even um, – our, our man Xavier Tillman, you know, when he got acquired, it was like, okay, uh, maybe Cornette's playing time will, will, will decrease. But Cornette did exactly what he was asked to do. He, he stepped in. He took a step forward. He made plays. He played He played decent defense. He was not, um, uh, you know, a mess out there at all. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. Took a major step forward and helped him win a championship. So I got to say – Luke Cornett, because I was not sure of his role this year. I just thought they need another big. They needed somebody else to step in and, and impose them, themselves as a, as a real force in the paint. But Luke Cornett did good enough, kept his role, stayed, you know, got his uh, contract guaranteed and stayed through the season and, and, and now is an NBA champion. Yeah, I Luke, that's a good one. That's a good one. But the, the guy that I, I'm, I'm going to go with is Sam Hauser because I, I honestly thought that his one-dimension ability to knock down shots wasn't going to keep, be enough to keep him in the rotation. I, I, I thought at some point he would fall off uh, and be – a borderline rotation guy, uh, but that never happened. And the thing, the reason why was because Sam showed himself to be 
a much better defender than I think most people thought. I mean, even though last season, you know, he had that, I thought, fluky stat where his defensive rating was just ridiculous, uh, but that had more to do with the guys around him than anything else. But if you watched him play this year, I mean, particularly in the, in the playoffs, the, the job that he did on Luca. I mean, Luca still got shots, but damn, Luca had to work way harder on Luke on on, on Sam Hauser than I think Luca thought that he would have to. Uh, it's one thing when Jalen Brown and and Kai, you know and Derek White and, and and those cats are defending you, but this is supposed to be their shooter, their their offensive sniper, and he's forcing you to turn the ball over and shoot more fadeaways than you thought you'd be able to shoot and and force you to do, do not go and just bully ball him because you can't do it the way you thought you could. Uh, Sam Hauser was the biggest surprise performer because he was able to be relatively consistent. He had a couple stretches there for four or five games where he was just out of it. And we saw, obviously, in the Indiana Pacers series, it was just a bad series. And we talked about that before, and that might be a rough one for him. But – Overall, I, I thought Sam was a really pleasant surprise for this team and gave them, I, I thought, a lot of juice that, frankly, um, I just didn't anticipate he would be able to do, particularly at both ends of the floor. Now, I'm going to take this next one right off the bat, the super sub. I'm going to go first, Gary. I'm going to call my number. I'm, get in the game, Shirai. You got this way. I'm calling my number. My super sub is your boy Luke Cornette. Uh, and I, I had to go with Luke because he was the one guy that come hell or high water, he found a way to get on the floor. And the thing that I, I really liked about Luke was he understood his role and he never tried to step outside of that. Luke was like, I'm going to screen. I'm going to jump and pretend to defend from the from the paint, even though you shoot behind a three point line or you shoot from the free throw line. I'm going to do that little that fake whatever defensive thing that he does uh, I'm gonna get a rebound here and there and I thought the one thing that I really appreciate about it Luke and I don't think most people saw this was when they got Tillman you go back and look at how he was playing he became a little bit better of a rebounder he became a little bit better uh, more aggressive around the basket he wasn't just setting screens like I think he was doing for the most part before Tillman got here. And the reason was very simple. He wanted to show that there was more to his game because he knew that this was a guy that was coming for his spot. Uh, th there's absolutely, there was no doubt in my mind that if Luke Cornett would have continued to play before Tillman got there, the way he did before that, and he continued to do that once Tillman arrived, he would have been at some point knocked out of the rotation because Tillman would have been doing things that they needed. And I thought Luke started doing more of the things that, were required of a seven foot big man uh, than he was doing previously. The one thing about Lil Cornette that I'm never going to understand, Gary, and maybe you can help me understand this because I, I don't get it. I watched a little bit of him when he was at Vanderbilt, just every now and then would catch it. And I remember going back after the Celtics acquired him and just kind of looking at what's the scouting report on him coming into the NBA. And I, and I talked to a couple of scouts about him and this, the scouting report on him was not what we saw, what we, we see in Boston. He was a seven footer who could stretch the floor. He could shoot threes. He could shoot from the perimeter. And you don't see that at all. And it feels like the Celtics, they got a guy that's helped them, obviously, win a championship. But the, the package that you thought you were getting, you never got. And I don't know whether it was one of those things where Luke decided, I'm just not going to fit in with these guys shooting the ball or is it something they told him or is it is it more of him just saying you know what guys don't I'm not going to shoot so don't even pass me to rock I'm just going to set screens uh, but it's baffling to me that you could have a such a clear and definitive role in this league a role that teams want they want a big who can stretch the floor who can space the floor and Luke Cornett for whatever reason doesn't seem to take advantage of that. And I, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I mean, am, am, I, am I crazy to think that Luke Cornett should have been a better shooter than he was? And I don't even know if he's a bad shooter. He just doesn't take shots. Yeah, I, I believe when he came first, I think the first game he came to Boston, I covered, it was a game against Oklahoma City in Oklahoma City. And he came off the bench and hit like three threes. He just was a savior for them in that game. There was... It might have been the, uh, right after the bubble, uh, maybe the 21-22 season. Whatever his first, he had just gotten acquired from, the, uh, I think it was the Knicks or whatever, wherever his last team was, um, or the Bulls. I want to say there's a Bulls. 
And um, he had hit like three threes. And then, like, and, and I knew him, him to be a stretch kind of guy, but he just never, after that, that he, it wasn't part of his game. And I think he took some threes, but he just, that his that part of his game has been completely shut down. And I don't understand it. Um, you'd like to think you'd like to think that uh, you know he could he could maybe hit hit shoot one or two per game because I think he, he's capable. But for whatever reason, the Celtics just this is like no man, you're not doing that. I mean, I'm just looking at. And he's life. got a coach who loves to take threes. He's got a coach who loves to take threes. I don't get yeah. it. Yeah, I want to say he was. Uh, let me see. He's taken – he took 193 threes in his second year. Um, he took 108 in his third year. So, But since then, you know, he's he's just not been a three-point shooter. And, and, and it's weird. When a guy takes 193, and then this year he took one, <laughs> obviously <laughs> someone, someone's telling him to not shoot. And he shot – the year he shot 193, he made 36 percent. So he made 70 threes. But for whatever reason, um, it just—I <laughs> don't know. Yeah. I really don't he, know. He, I mean, yeah, he, I mean, he, he's definitely a guy who you know. You look at his skill set and you look at what he brings to the table. You, you feel like though there is more to his game than we saw. Uh, and I'm just I, I'd be I'd be very curious to see if he were to, you know, sign with another team, whether we would see him become more of a stretch big, because uh, I got to believe that any team that outside of Boston that he plays for, they're going to look for him to be a little bit more of a factor on the offensive end of the floor, particularly if he's a seven footer who can shoot threes. I mean, if you're shooting threes at a 36 percent clip and you're a seven footer. Yeah, you bet. You damn well better be taking some threes yeah. because that that's I mean, that fits in very much with the, the, the analytics movement now uh, taking threes versus twos. Uh, but, you know, the thing about Cornette, I will say this is that he's a guy that uh, certainly his numbers don't necessarily equate to the value that he has for this team. You want to catch the hottest games this summer, but don't want to mortgage the family home or take a second job to do so. Right. Game time makes getting tickets to events like WNBA games even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. That's a huge get when it comes to getting great deals at the ballpark or basketball arena nearest you. Here in Boston, every season is sporting season. So for me, the Game Time app makes it super easy to find tickets for just about every sport in my area, which is great this time of year when family and friends just happen to pop into town at the last minute and you're scrambling to find something to do and you're trying to find something to do that won't break the bank like getting tickets to see the red hot Red Sox play who are playing some of their best baseball right now. Game Time has you covered. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Which brings me to our next question. Uh, when you look at the Celtics roster, Gary, I mean, there, there are lots of guys who contributed did a lot of great things for them. But who was that one guy that you thought contributed more to the team and maybe didn't have the numbers to back it up, but their their, their contributions were significant? Mm, I'm going to say Peyton Pritchard. Not putting up the big numbers, but obviously the king of the half-court shot, giving him a spark, getting offensive rebounds, playing well defensively, just being, you know, getting those putbacks, you know, Muscling up against guys who are six, seven, eight inches taller and getting that ball up into the hoop and, and for the layup, like just being a tough guy and, and showing his worth. And obviously, like, you know, Peyton's never going to be a, a, probably, an, you know, an all star and, and a guy who's going to average 25 points a game or 20 points a game. But he has a role in this league and it's about finding that role. And being consistent and knowing you're going to get minutes and you're going to get an opportunity. And I just think this year, 
He found his niche. And even in the playoffs where he got kind of at times unplayable, he didn't have great minutes um, in the in the NBA Finals against Dallas. There was some times he slipped on defense. He wasn't hitting open shots. You know, besides the half quarters, he, he really wasn't hitting yeah. open shots in the finals. He did not have a great NBA Finals, but I just thought he found a role to, to like, listen, I'm going to do whatever I can to – contribute to a championship team. And that took a lot of unselfishness. And he also got paid for it. He also got an extension contract extension. And for me, I think sometimes guys have to be realistic. Like, you know, if you're Peyton, your goal is to have a long career. Your goal is to play right. 10 years in the league. Get your pension, play 10, 10 years in the league. However, you got to get to that year 10. And it can't and it, it's gonna be where it's like, you know what, it ain't going to be a superstar. That's not my path. My path is a, you know, like we look at a guy like a TJ McConnell who's been around six, seven years, right? A guy who does his job, does it right, can do little things, hustles, and that's what makes you last in the league for 10 years. And I think Peyton is starting to follow that path of like, okay, I think I can be a superstar in this league. I think I can be a guy who can, you know, average 15, 18 points to like, you know what? I'm just going to be the guy who could do the roles that I need to help team, a team win. And those are valuable players. Run point guard, play defense. He's got to do a better job of hitting open shots. He got off to a really slow start this season, yeah. picked it up, but then had a kind of a slow ending. Um, that's what it's going to keep Peyton in the league and, and keep Peyton in the league for 10 years. Because there's guys in the league, you know, I look at a guy way back in the day like a Scott Brooks, you know, guys who played a Jose Berea, like guys who weren't stars but were stars in their role and played 10 or 12 years because they did exactly what they're supposed to do. They didn't ask. They didn't complain about minutes. They didn't complain about roles. This is what you want me to do. I'm going to be the best at it. And I think that's what the role Peyton Pritchard has to play in order to remain in the league 10 years. Because that's what that's the goal. Like, you know, you can talk about, well, I want to make all-star teams and MVPs. But if you look, if you're Peyton, you say, listen, I just want to be a contributor on a championship caliber team every year and get to 10 years and, and say I had a good, solid, admirable NBA career. And and that's what he's – he's on that path, and I think this year put him on that path. Yeah, yeah, I, w- I would agree. He, he's a, that's a good pick. But the, the guy that I'm going to go with is Al Horford. Uh, Al, when you look at his numbers, you know, most of the, the key stats were down, not just down, but like career lows. And when you're 38 years old, you know, you're clearly near the end of your NBA career. You're having a season where your numbers across the board are down. And the, the conventional wisdom says that you're not able to give this team what it needs. But Al – to his credit, when they needed him to step up in the playoffs, he was that guy. Uh, when they needed him to really, really come through in the regular season, uh, I thought he had a number of games where he was a major difference maker. Uh, and his, you know, the, the bottom line, his numbers are not that impressive this year. I mean, 8.6 points per game. He played, I think, about 26 or so minutes a game, which was a career low for him as well. But to his credit, he maximized uh, – the time he was on the floor uh, and gave them something, even if it wasn't something that showed up in the stat sheet, his impact, his presence uh, was major, major for this team to win a championship. Uh, and, and so, you know, Al, you know, people are going to you know, really, I think, lock in on what he was able to do in the playoffs and, and, and give him his flowers for that. And he deserves it. But if you really start to break down what he did during the regular season, the playoffs were just icing on the cake because Al Horford was a man among, uh, you know, boys on this team and from the standpoint of leadership from the standpoint of accountability from the standpoint of just really making those necessary plays needed in order to win and and the other thing too about Al we were talking about Luke Cornett uh and not shooting Al does not have that problem and the thing that people you know I, I don't know if they really un- embrace this but Al has shot better than 40 percent for three-point range the last two years yeah I mean how many guys get the amount of three three point shots that Al gets. He usually gets four or five a game and shoots at a low to mid 40% clip. 
that's just not normal. And a lot of that, again, is Al getting to the spot he wants to get to, Tatum and Brown being able to suck in the defense and leave him open for catch and shoot threes. Uh, I was glad to see Al, once we got to the playoffs, remind folks that you do realize that I used to get buckets at the on the block. Uh, I used to take kids downtown and, sh- and you know, and just, just go to work. And it was good to see him get back to doing that kind of stuff because, again, I, I, I think the Celtics had a couple of guys that could certainly – play that inside outside game at a high level. Uh, and, and one of those guys uh, is our good friend, Chris Dasperzingis, who we recently learned uh, is going to have surgery and it's unclear when he will be back up and at him uh, for the Celtics, uh, whether it'll be before training camp, during training camp, once the season starts, who knows, but Gary, you know, the, the Celtics really don't have a lot of off season concerns, but certainly Porzingis is help. I would imagine is one of them. How concerned are you about him returning from this injury? Which, you know, all indications are, I know you, you, you know, some of your globe colleagues have written about this extremely rare injury that, that he suffered. How concerned are you about his comeback from that? Yeah. Um, I'm not concerned. I just think you got to give him plenty of time to, to recover. Mm-hmm. And, you're not going to rush him back um, at all. You're going to let him, and, and, and if that means you have to sign a another back backup big to you know supplement those minutes, you're going to have to do that because you don't want to put too much pressure on Al. But if it's if it if, if this bleeds into the season, that's what it might have to be because you don't want to bring him back too early. I'm not concerned. It, so, it sounds like something that they just have to kind of put the tendon back in place, put the sleeve that holds the tendon back in place, and it's going to be some uh, mobility issues, maybe two to three months. But three months is the start of training camp. Remember, Shiraz, as you know, like the Celtics start the year in Dubai against the Nuggets, which I think they get an extra week uh, of pre- preparation time. So I think training camp for them might start – literally like September 20th. So, you know, three months from now is camp. And, you know, if Porzingis gets the surgery, let's say in two weeks or 10 days, and he's still going to be in recovery, right? I I don't think they're going to be like, okay, you're going to be 100% in two months. He's going to have to figure out how to walk, then start jogging, then run, then start doing basketball stuff, all of that. So I think I'm not concerned about long term. I'm just concerned about who's going to take those minutes when he's gone and then bringing him back slowly. So when he's ready, he's ready as opposed to bringing him back and, okay, well, he he got hurt again or he's laboring. No, you don't want that. So if I'm if I'm the um, Celtics, I think obviously I think you take your time with that. You take your time and uh, bring him back when he's ready. And then you got to have reinforcements. you got to have bigs in there that can take those minutes, whether it's Kata, whether it's Al Horford, whether it's you bring back Cornette, whatever. You definitely have to have some reinforcements because you're going to miss them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you don't know where those reinforcements are going to come from, as Gary alluded to. I mean, it could be the players that, that we've talked about. It could be whoever they take with that 30th pick. Uh, May very will be called into duty to give them 5, 10, 15 minutes of spot duty to help, you know, uh, you know, kind of get them through that that period of time. But uh, it's a good problem to have when you're the champions, when you, you've got a guy that you know – will give literally give anything he can to get out there and help you win. Uh, because when you look at the the note, uh, you know, just a, announcing that he's going to have surgery, it's pretty clear that he, sh- if it wasn't for the NBA finals, I don't think he would have been out there playing. Um, and to his credit, he was able to, to give them just enough that they needed. Uh, and, and that is certainly admirable and certainly speaks to, you know, his mental toughness and his desire to win a championship and, and to the Celtics credit, you know, they were able to make it through uh, relatively unscathed as far as you know, post injury for him, uh, where there's nothing that looks like it's going to be career threatening or anything like that. So, um, well, look, that is it for this week's uh, NBA Big Three, the Big Three NBA podcast. Uh, before we go, just one more shout out to Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media Network. Also, our good friends at Game Time. 
which takes the guesswork out of buying last minute tickets to your favorite sporting events. Just download the game, just download the game time app, create an account and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. For Gary Washburn, this is H. Rob Blakely, and this is the Big 3 NBA Podcast. We out.